Welcome to this grassy field in the middle of rural Maharashtra and a Mercedes G-Wagon. Now I love these things, they're more than just an SUV, they're an entire occasion. Now you've got to understand that thus far in India, the G-Wagon has only ever been sold in AMG guys. And that means a big, shouty, petrol powered V8. They are absolutely epic. However, their price is equally epic and they also come with epic running costs. So now Mercedes has introduced this for the first time in India, the G350D, a diesel powered G-Wagon that promises to be just that little bit more sensible. But can a G-Wagon be sensible? Should a G-Wagon be sensible? Can you really have your cake and eat it too? Well, that's what I hope to find out today. Now it's important to remember what exactly the appeal of the G-Wagon is, especially to Indian customers in the first place. For most of them, it's the way this thing looks. And you've got to admit, this diesel version sticks really close to the formula that was set by the AMGs. The shape is pretty much the same, but of course, there are a few differences. The grille on the front, it's the normal horizontal grille as opposed to the vertical slats you get on the AMG. The bumpers are a bit different, the wheels are a bit different, and for God's sakes, there are no side pipes. Okay, they are actually down there. They just don't stick out of the car. This looks like any old SUV. So very sensible. But the looks aren't the only thing people love about the G-Wagon. The other thing people want from their G-Class is off-road ability. Now I know what you're thinking. Who in their right mind, in India at least, would ever take their G-Wagon off-roading? Aha, well, they don't necessarily have to, but what they're buying into is the legacy of the G-Class. And of course, it is and always has been an incredible off-roader. So they want to be comfortable in the knowledge that their money is well spent and that their G-Class can take them wherever they ever dream of going. Say for instance, now I could have taken the road, but I have chosen instead to go across this rocky field just because I can. I don't even need to use all three of the differentials. I've just locked the center differential and put the car in low range and well, it's sailing over everything. Also helping things is the 360 degree camera array that's showing me everything around. And this is but the tip of the iceberg of what the G-Wagon can do. And since there was no off-road proving ground to really test its true capabilities, I headed over to where most G-Wagons in India will spend their time. Some smooth, clean tarmac. To see if the G350D could possibly thrill in the same way a G63 can. Now of course, a very important part of the G63, just like with every other AMG, is the engine. And that is of course something you don't get here. In the place of the 4-litre twin-turbo hand-built V8 from a Falterbach, what you get is the straight-six 3-litre diesel from the S-Class. And yes, of course, it's BS6 compliant. So in place of that wonderful, barking mad V8 engine note, what you get is very good refinement, actually. Okay, this engine is not as quiet in this car as it is in the S-Class, understandably. But it's really rather impressive for a diesel engine. You will hear it a little bit sooner than you would in an S-Class as well because of course this car is a lot heavier than that car and this engine needs to work a little bit harder to get things going. When it does come alive, it actually doesn't sound all that bad. This new straight six sounds a damn sight better than the old Mercedes V6 diesel. Let me just dial it up into sport mode to show you what I mean. Sounds pretty good, huh? And that brings me to the other thing that you miss from the AMG V8 and that is of course the performance. That car had 585 horsepower. This one has nearly 300 horsepower less at 286. But with a big heavy SUV like this, it's the other figure, the torque, that's almost equally important. 
While the AMG makes 850nm of torque, this one makes 600nm, which is still quite a lot. And it makes all 600 of those Newton meters at just 1200 RPM. But how does that feel? Well, while the AMG felt like a surprise sucker punch to the jaw every time you put your foot down, this one feels like more of a spirited nudge, if you know what I mean. But don't be fooled, the Diesel G is no slouch. When we plugged it into our satellite guided V-Box testing equipment, it recorded a 0 to 60 kph time of 3.33 seconds, a 0 to 100 kph time of 7.53 seconds, and kick down overtaking times from 20 to 80 and 40 to 100 that were both comfortably under 6 seconds. So yeah, it's not quite as quick as the 4 litre twin turbo V8 petrol version, but it certainly isn't slow. But here's the other thing. You tend to forgive the AMG G63 quite a few things because it's just so mad. It's a ludicrous car, it's a bit of a toy and well, it does get away with a lot of small flaws. But because this G350D is the sensible version of the G-Class, I think that opens it up to a little bit more scrutiny. For instance, in this car, I don't mind pointing out that rear visibility is rather appalling, thanks largely to that huge spare tire strapped onto the tailgate. Then there's more fundamental stuff, like the ride quality. Sure, it rides a little bit better than the AMG thanks to it using smaller wheels, 20 inches versus 22 inches on that car. But it still has a very, very lumpy ride, especially at low speeds, thanks to its rigid rear axle. However, it has to be said that once you do pick up the pace, it absolutely demolishes potholes, speed breakers, just about anything that goes under the wheels. <laughs> this car truly feels invincible. The other thing is, of course, this is no handler. You're not going to enjoy driving this around like you would some other luxury SUV, so don't go expecting that at all. The trade-off is the high, tall, commanding seating position that lets you lord over everybody around you. And for most people, I think that commanding feeling will be enough to counter this car's lack of dynamic prowess. And yes, while fuel consumption isn't as ridiculously high as the AMG Petrol V8, this diesel G-Wagon is far from what you'd call efficient. We didn't do the full autocar fuel test, but over our day of mixed driving, the car's own fuel computer showed single-digit KPL figures. It likely has something to do with this car's 2.5-ton curb weight, but hey, the huge size does at least mean it's spacious. It does have a very huge and useful boot. In fact, it's very, very practical and the loading lip is not too high either. What isn't so great is the back seat. You sit really high up, really upright. And though headroom is really great, legroom is simply not up to luxury SUV standards. The seat cushioning could have been better too, but then I guess this is one luxury SUV where the owner might actually be in the driver's seat. Do you see what I mean? When you take the G-Wagon off its AMG pedestal, you have to judge it in the same way that you do other luxury SUVs. Now I gotta say, I love the way this cabin is trimmed. There's leather just about everywhere, beautiful brushed aluminium trim all over the place, the buttons feel really nice, and everything is screwed together just so solidly. But there is one thing to note, this car is full of G Manufacture accessories. Now G Manufacture is the name of Mercedes accessory catalog specifically for the G-Wagon. Make no mistake, the G has a very luxurious interior as standard. But we feel that a lot of owners won't mind digging heavily into the catalog to make sure their car is like no one else's. It's also worth noting that though this car is equipped to the same level as the G63 we tested some time back, a lot more of the stuff on this car is optional. Again, the essentials are standard like LED headlamps, 8-color ambient lighting, a rear-view camera, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and even some connected car tech. But if you want stuff like the Burmester audio system, adaptive LED headlamps, 64 colors for your ambient lighting, seat heating, cooling and massage, and, oh yes, the sunroof, you'll have to pay extra. And here's the thing, at 1.5 crore rupees X showroom before those options, the G350D is still very expensive. 
Sure, a G63 may cost 50% more than this, but then this one in turn costs 50% more than a GLS. While usually buyers of luxury cars are happy to settle for a smaller engine if it means a more reasonable price, does that still apply when the price is north of 1.5 crore rupees? The diesel G-Wagon then is a bit of an anomaly. You're certainly getting the best of both worlds, the rugged appeal of a G-Class, insane off-road ability included, in a package that's cheaper to buy and to run. Still, we suspect that most people who've decided to splurge on an indulgence like a G-Wagon would be happy to go the whole hog and just get an AMG G63 instead. Now, a few weeks ago, Land Rover launched this in India. This, of course, is the updated or facelifted Discovery Sport. Now, when you talk about a facelift, you normally talk about a bit of a nip and tuck in a couple of regions. But this is a lot more. A new platform, a couple of updated engines, changes on the exterior and on the interior. So, let's dive a little bit deeper and see what's really new. Let's talk about those obvious changes on the exterior first. There are elements similar to the larger full-size Discovery, especially around the front bumper, which is smoother, more aggressive and has a lot more girth to it, at least visually. The S variant that we have here is the entry-level model that gets a pronounced silver skid plate on the lower half, matched with unpainted claddings around the edges and the sides. The grille is painted in a similar shade of silver with the typical Land Rover honeycomb design and the headlamps that are also akin to the ones on the bigger Discovery now get sharper with new LED daytime running lights and LED lighting elements as standard across all variants. Along the sides, the changes are minimal with the exception of new wheels and around the back, you get a similarly updated bumper with a set of new LED tail lights that have a really detailed lighting element. Now moving to the interior of the Discovery Sport, it's certainly become a much nicer, a more luxurious place to be in. But some of the quirks that I used to particularly love of the pre-facelift car have sort of been replaced by something more conventional like the gear lever. This more conventional gear lever replaces the older rotary knob that I particularly liked. I thought it was a very cool, maybe a little bit of a gimmick, but very cool feature nonetheless. You also get a lot of nice raw wood finish on center console, on the side panels and the dashboard. A lot of use of brushed aluminium and of course gloss black. The centerpiece of the dashboard of course is the new 10 inch high definition infotainment screen that now thankfully features a brand new and much more usable user interface. You also get the usual like inbuilt navigation, Apple CarPlay, ambient lighting and of course some off-road data screens for when you go off the beaten path. And just below that big touchscreen is this big massive gloss flag slab that has all the buttons you need for your climate control and some of the buttons actually double up to do more things. So for example, the fan button is in place of the temperature control for the passenger seat. Other features include a new steering wheel with haptic feedback controls, a part digital part analog instrument cluster on this variant and a massive panoramic roof. The top spec variants do however get a full digital instrument cluster like this one here and that clear sight rear view camera and mirror screen package. One of the main draws of the Land Rover Discovery Sport is the fact that it is a 7 seat SUV and that seating configuration continues on the updated model too. But while there's a decent amount of space, the rear seat in particular offers slightly less under thigh support and the seat itself, both front and rear, are overly firm and just don't feel as plush as compared to some of its rivals. The third row is best reserved for children or for very short trips as there isn't enough space for a fully grown adult to spend any extended amount of time there. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the new Discovery Sport is now underpinned by a brand new platform. It's called the Premium Transverse Architecture and it's essentially the same platform that underpins the new Evoque. Now, the first thing you realize straight away as you get into the car is the fact that it is a lot more comfortable. It's a lot more pliant in terms of ride, definitely soaks up bumps and bad roads a lot better. And the other big difference is the fact that it is also a lot quieter, not just in terms of engine noise, but just in terms of general road noise as well. The other thing you do notice, it feels a little lighter on its feet. It feels a little more nimble, a little more active. And I guess now the sport part of the Discovery Sport 
really comes into play a lot more. The steering gives you confidence in the corners, although it is a bit on the heavier side sometimes, which might be a bit off-putting for urban users. And while ride comfort over rougher roads is better, as we mentioned, the Disco Sport does pick up those small ridges and broken surfaces, and it has noticeable amount of body roll while changing lanes or while cornering hard. It is not just the platform though that has been updated, but also the engines. You get a 2-litre petrol with a 48-volt mild hybrid system, making 245 horsepower and 365 newton meters of torque, or the 2-litre diesel that we have with us today. This definitely doesn't feel like a slouch. Now, it's made it to a 9-speed automatic gearbox, and that gearbox has definitely been retuned in the update because even in normal drive mode, it doesn't feel as laggy or unresponsive as it felt earlier in the pre-facelift car. If you have a light enough right leg, the Discovery Sport will be happy to cruise around in the ninth gear at speeds as low as 80 km per hour, something most other SUVs with as many gears do not do. That said, when you do pin the throttle down and munch through the revs, power delivery does start to taper off rather quickly with that mildly disappointing top-end performance in the rev range. And while there is still some gruffness and it really can't match the level of refinement one notices with the Germans, it is an improvement over the early Discovery Sport. Of course, all variants get all-wheel drive as expected, mated to those rather legendary off-road modes like sand, snow, mud and an easier auto mode that lets the car's brain do the thinking. But there's no use just talking about them. This, of course, is a Land Rover and that means I'm obliged to take it off-road even if it's on a bit of a fast gravel trail. Let's go discover some. If you thought the Disco Sport was good on broken roads, it really comes into its own, especially on trails like these. And as we bash through the Deccan countryside, kicking up dust on what was a glorious day with blue skies, the Disco Sport did everything we asked for without a single bit of fuss. Back on the road, the all-around nature of the Discovery Sport facelift answers the big question. Is the update big enough for you to take notice? Yes. The SUV certainly shows remarkable improvement over the pre-facelift Discovery Sport and while engine refinement is still off mark against its rivals or its handling is not as sharp, it does offer a contemporary look, a cabin packed with tech, especially on the R-Dynamic version and of course the ability to go off-road with relative ease if you ever intend to. And with that predatory pricing starting at 57 lakh 6,000 rupees for both petrol and diesel, the Discovery Sport facelift does make a very strong case for itself. We are well into the lockdown period. It is possible that we could also have to work from home for longer and a lot of you are worried about those cars that have been parked and stationary for long. Here are a few key tips to keeping your car in good working condition. We all know that the battery gets depleted if we don't start the car for too long. So, rule number one is to start your vehicle once a week and keep it running for at least 15 minutes. I'm sure everyone can do that, but just in case you can't, then the next best thing would be to disconnect the battery's negative terminal to prevent discharge. Now, while starting up the car is one aspect, all the moving parts also need to be kept running. Try to take the car for a spin in the society compound or just move it forward and backward. This will help prevent flat spots on the tires as well. Do remember to also switch on the air conditioner and also give the indicators and brake lights a round of run just to keep them all functioning. While you may feel it is good to have the handbrake engaged for safety, especially if you are parked on a slope, that is not the case. It could become jammed over a long period. So, simply park the car in gear instead. If you are on a slope, use stones or chalks to prevent it from rolling, if the gear slips. This is in the case of a manual. 
for an automatic, just don't engage the handbrake and leave it in park. In case your brakes are stuck, just engage and disengage the handbrake a couple of times or in the case of some cars that use the wheel brakes, drive it in the compound and dab the brake pedal a few times, this may help free them. Make sure that the cabin is clean and there is no leftover wrappers, bottles or trash inside. Dust off the mats and keep the AC vents clean too. We have another whole video on how to sanitize your cabin. So watch that too for some tips on sanitizing the cabin. Last but not the least, protecting the exterior is important too. So remember to get your car washed or wiped regularly to avoid damaging the paint. Since everyone has time on their hands, might be a good idea to wash down your own car or wax it. Remember to try and keep it parked in a shaded spot too. A few simple things that can be done to keep your car safe and good to go when we can finally get back on the road. And now it's time for tips on sustainability and protecting the environment with Servo Futura G Plus from Indian Oil. Choose a smaller car if you don't need the size and space. Overloading the car with weight makes it work harder. 